maybe everyone can hear and I'm gonna try to talk into the mic because someone said that if you don't there will be people in places that don't hear so I'm gonna but I need to just by way of introduction tell you that these remarks were first prepared for a lamp presentation at the University of Texas one month before the 2016 present presidential election so that was when they were first put together and as I said then that any sane person would say no way but I hope that what I share with you will be objective and in a nonpartisan way and I'm doing this just a couple of minutes by introduction my mentor for constitutional law was Charles Allen Wright he was a conservative Republican, that associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was not conservative, was described, and she said he was colossal, standing at the summit of our profession. Charles Allen Wright, many of you knew him here. Leonard Garment, when he was president of Richard Nixon's general counsel, he summoned Charlie to be the special legal consultant to the White House for help on the constitutional issues that were involved in the Watergate crisis. Charlie did not hesitate to accept that assignment. And this is how he explains why he took on such a thankless task. And this is a quote from him. I believe in the president and I believe in the presidency. And that is why I am in this case. 10 years before, in 1964, in an interview, this lifelong conservative Republican explained his reluctant vote against Senator Barry Goldwater, the Republican candidate for president. And this again is Charlie. He said, I can vote for a candidate who is skeptical about the United Nations, critical of Social Security, against Medicare and federal aid to education and in favor of selling the Tennessee Valley Authority. But, but he said, I cannot vote for a candidate whose election would be regarded as a mandate to slow down on civil rights and take a harder, more dangerous line in foreign relations. And he said, accordingly, I will vote for Lyndon B. Johnson. Charles Allen Wright was my mentor. In his third year at UT, he named me to be his quiz master. By today's standards, that would be his research assistant. At his direction, I did the original research on his contribution to the monumental redo of the 54 volume treatise, Federal Practice and Procedure. So most of what I will share with you this evening is shaped by Charles Allen Wright's teaching in a book of required reading for that long ago course in constitutional law. And the title of it was Nine Men, A Political History of the Supreme Court from 1790 to 1955. It was written by Charlie's mentor at the Yale School of Law, a fellow by the name of Fred Rodell. So this assignment, and I don't know why that keeps showing up like that. This assignment has taken me on an absolutely fabulous journey to better understand the United States Supreme Court, <coughs> but also to, to understand my own life. <coughs> Fred Rodell's constitutional law mentor at Yale was William O. Douglas, who at the age of 40 was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court where he served for 36 years, 209 days, from 1939 to 1975. The longest term in the history of the court at the time I put the remarks first together. <clears throat> Out of a class of 120, Charlie assigned nine of us to study and be prepared to represent the nine justices to whom he assigned us. He named me to play the role of William O. Douglas. I read every book that Douglas had written at that time and most of his court opinions. In many ways, 
this presentation is my way to say thank you to Charles Allen Wright for directing my life when I was not even aware that he was doing it. So now let me begin as any lawyer should. May it please the court. <laughs> Fred Rodell <coughs> opened his classic book with this paragraph. At the top level of the three branches of the civilian government of the United States sit the Congress, the President plus his cabinet, and the Supreme Court. Of these three, in this unmilitary, unclerical nation, only one wears a uniform. Only one carries on its most important business in utter secrecy behind locked doors, and indeed never reports, even after death, what really went on there. Only one, its members holding office for life if they choose, is completely irresponsible to anyone or anything for themselves or their own con but themselves and their own consciences. Under our otherwise democratic form of government, only one top ruling group uses ceremony and secrecy, robes and ritual as instruments of its official policy as wellsprings of its power. The nine men who are of the Supreme Court of the United States, and remember this was 1958, are at once the most powerful and the most irresponsible of all the men in the world who govern other men. So that's the end of that quotation. And you may think this characterization is too critical, but here are two observations by the New York Times review of Jeffrey Tubin's 2007 book entitled The Nine Inside the Secret World of the Supreme Court explaining how difficult it is to be a reporter covering the Supreme Court. And these are Jeffrey Tubin's words. Try to imagine any group of government, the White House or the State Department, covered solely on the basis of public events and printed releases with nothing about its inner workings. It's inconceivable, but that's essentially how it is to be a reporter covering the Supreme Court. Getting into the court's internal operations and culture is nearly impossible. Examining the justices critically, grading the quality and propriety of intellectual honesty of their work is dangerous. Details about the drama, the passion, and the pettiness of the place, about the way it does its work, which is our work, the work of the people in this country, emerge is only years after the fact. To understand the demographics of the Supreme Court of the United States, you have to consider the gender, the ethnicity, the religion, the geography, and economic background of at that time 112 people who had been appointed to the court. Constitutional scholars have examined all of these characteristics since the court was established in 1789, when at that time there were only six justices. For its first 180 years, think about this, justices were almost always white male Protestants. Prior to the 20th century, a few Roman Catholics had been appointed, but the concern about diversity on the court was more about geography it was more important to represent all regions of the country rather than to consider ethnic, religious, or gender diversity. And here are just a few benchmarks to think about. The 20th century saw the appointment of a Jewish justice, Louis Brandeis, 1916. An African-American, Thurgood Marshall, 1967 an Italian-American, Antonio Scalia, 1986. And finally, finally, a woman, Sandra Day O'Connor, 1981. And here I should point out that Sandra Day O'Connor's appointment was 26 years after Fred Prodell 
ended writing his book about nine men 26 years later. The 21st century saw the first appointment of an Hispanic Justice, Sonia Sotomayor, in 2009. In spite of the interest in the court's demographics and the symbolism accompanying the inevitable political appointment process, gender, race, educational background, a religious or religious views on the justices has played little role in their jurisprudence. For example, at the time they were, these remarks were together, the two African American justices, Thurgood Marshall and Clarence Thomas, very seldom agreed on their judicial philosophies. William Brenham and Antonio Scalia shared a Catholic faith and a Harvard Law School education, but they shared little in the way of jurisprudence philosophy. The court's first two female justices, O'Connor and Ginsburg, voted together no more often than their male colleagues. And I know this is too much detail for a 45 minute presentation, but here are just a few observations. Herbert Hoover, when he appointed Cardoza, a Sephardic Jew, was more concerned about having three New York justices than he was about having two Jewish members on the court. Richard Nixon attempted to employ the Southern strategy, hoping to secure support for Southern states by nominating justices from the South. He unsuccessfully nominated Southerners, claiming Hainsworth of South Carolina and G. Harold Carswell from Georgia. Neither one were able to move forward and he finally nominated Henry Blackman from Minnesota. In 2014, the court has a majority from the Northeastern United States, with seven justices from states in the North and East of Washington, D.C., including four justices born and reared in New York City. The remaining two justices come from Georgia and California, that's Justice Thomas and Judge Kennedy at that time. Jeffrey Tooman in his 2007 books sought to plumb the court's deepest mystery. And then think about this one because we have a lot of politics we talk about today. But this was 2007 and what he was really starting to try to get at is why in the world is the tribunal so dominated by Republicans, not shifted more radically rightward. And at the time of the, he wrote his book in 2007, there had been only two, think about this, only two Democratic nominees in the last 40 years. 40 years. And he was trying to say why had it not shifted in that period of time. And since that time, President Obama's made two appointments, so to my your and Elena, Elena Kagan. And just prior to the election, there was an article on the dilemma of Chief Justice Roberts, what he would have faced if Hillary Clinton had won and appointed justices that leaned her, her way politically. Should he shift to the moderate middle or would he become a dissenter as Chief Justice Rehnquist did when the political persuasion of the court shifted to the left. But if the Chief Justice, and think about this mechanic, it's an important one as you look at these opinions, if the Chief Justice is in the majority, he can determine who writes the opinion. If the Chief Justice is in the minority, the senior judge on the court determines who writes the opinion. And most Chief Justices want to preserve that prerogative to determine who writes the opinion of the court because that's what's going to be living for history. And prior to the death of Judge Scalia, there was a, what was once an all Protestant court was composed of six of Roman Catholic faith and three whose faith was Judaism, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan. There was not a single Protestant on the court of a court that for 180 years had been all Protestant. So prior to Justice Scalia's death, five justices had law degrees from Harvard, three from Yale, 
and one from Columbia. Most scholars agree that Jeffrey Tubin's observation about Sandra Day O'Connor, and this is a quote, she is the justice who through her pragmatic seat of the pants and jurisprudence single-handedly kept the court close to the American mainstream, particularly on matters like reproduction freedom and affirmative action, end of quote. O'Connor, and another historical fact, O'Connor was the last justice to have held an elective office. She was twice elected to the Arizona State Senate after being appointed there by the governor. Most people don't know this, but she was a Texan. She was born in El Paso, Texas. She graduated from Austin High School in El Paso in 1946. And then she grew up on a cattle ranch in Duncan, Arizona. To keep faith with my original assignment from the LAMP people, there is a comment, I have to make a comment about unsuccessful nominations. As of 2010, there had been 151 people who had been nominated. 29 nominees, including one nominated for promotion, had not been successful on at least their first try. In the 1968 LBJ episode of Abe Fortas, Homer Thornberry demonstrated how dramatically politics and appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court are joined at the hip. In June of 1968, Chief Justice Earl Warren informed President Lyndon Johnson that he planned to retire. Warren was concerned that Richard Nixon might win the presidency later that year and would get to choose his successor. Johnson shared Warren's concern about Nixon, and he welcomed the opportunity to make his third appointment to the court. Therefore, he nominated his longtime confidant, Associate Justice Abe Fortas, who was also a drinking and a poker playing buddy. There's a little bit more to that one. Johnson knew that several senators would be concerned about some of Fortas's liberal opinions, so he simultaneously declared his intention to fill Fortas's vacancy with the Bills Court Justice Homer Thornberry. The president believed that because Thornberry was a conservative Texan, it would mollify skeptical Southern senators. Johnson was a master of counting the votes in the Senate. He concluded that despite warnings of a filibuster, he just barely had enough support to confirm Fortas. He was encouraged that his former Senate mentor, Richard Russell from Georgia, and Representative Republican Minority Leader Everett Dirksen indicated that they would support Fortas, mainly because they respected the great brilliance of his legal analysis. The president lost Russell, and think about this, he lost Russell's support. They're, they used to have breakfast almost every week. He lost Russell's support because Russell wanted a judge to be appointed in Georgia to the, to the district court, and it got tangled up in the administration, delayed and delayed, and Russell said, oh, hell, I'm not going to support your man for the Supreme Court. That was his reason for changing. Johnson urged Senate leaders to waste no time convening the Forbes nomination. <coughs> his, his staff had assured him, I'll take a break here. His staff had assured him that Dirksen was still there. Johnson told one of his aides, this is a direct quote, he said, take my word for it, I know Dirksen, I know the Senate. If they get this thing drug out very long, we're going to get beat. Nurse will leave us. Fortas became the first sitting associate justice nominated to be chief justice to testify in his own confirmation hearing. But the hearings reinforced what most senators already knew. And here I want you just to think about this. As a sitting justice, as a sitting justice on the court, he regularly attended White House staff meetings. He briefed the president on the secret court deliberations, and on behalf of the president, he pressured senators who opposed the war in Vietnam. 
and this is just true of this case, it would be, it could be others, when the Judiciary Committee revealed that Fortas received a private funded stipend equivalent to 40% of his court salary to teach at the American University for a summer, Nerkson and others withdrew their support. Although the committee recommended confirmation, floor consideration sparked a filibuster. And on October the 1st, the Senate failed to invoke closure. Johnson withdrew the nomination, and he privately observed to one of his key staffers that if he had had another term, Fortis' appointment would have been different. There you have, I think, maybe the best case study I could find on the influence of politics on the Supreme Court, maybe up to the current time. As we, sp as we spend a few minutes on politics in the court, I should introduce the topic to you as my lanky six foot five mentor, Charles Allen Wright, did in 1957 when he came in pompously arriving at our constitutional law class wearing loafers with taps. <laughs> he clicked in in long strides, tapping all the way. He took the folding chair by the desk at the front of the room. Sitting to the side, he placed his well-polished shoes accompanied by white socks on the desk. <laughs> Without any word of introduction, he bellowed, Hughes Marbury versus Madison. That was my introduction to Charles Allen Wright. I was terrified. <laughs> it was my first meeting with him. Benny Hughes was already a CPA he had made the highest grade on our first law school exams. He would become the Grand Chancellor and editor of the Law Review. He immediately gave his take on Marbury versus Madison and then spent almost half of an hour jousting with, the pres with Professor Wright. It was my introduction in one of the most significant periods during the history of the court, the tenure of Chief Justice John Marshall back 1801 to 1835. Marbury versus Madison is the landmark case that held that the Supreme Court could overturn a law passed by Congress if it violated the Constitution and it legally cemented what is called the power of judi judicial review. The Marshall Court also held that the Bill of Rights restricted the federal government alone and did not apply to the states. I didn't know that for a long time. Later courts would hold that the 14th Amendment passed after the Civil War had the effect of applying most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights to the states. So most of the scholars of the court often refer to John Marshall as the great Chief Justice. If there's anything sinister or wrong about the system, whereby every president naturally tries to appoint justices who slant toward the big problems of government. It follows and fits with the appointing president's slant. <coughs> the wrongdoing does not lie in the fact that justices are still men and women and that they are still themselves. The wrongness lies rather in the fact that these justices remaining themselves attaining the power of justices and retaining the power for sometimes over 30 years, it inevitably it acts as a check, a lag on the former movement, movement of government and on the way a democracy directs national policy by electing officials who are perpetually responsible to the voters for what they do or don't do. And especially in times of crisis and change, a real <coughs> <coughs> a reluctant and a backward-looking Supreme Court dominated by justice who owe their power to a repudiated president or party can create at least friction and at most chaos in the running of the nation. Here are just a few examples. The John Marshall Court, all of whom were Federalists, slowed down the operation of Andrew Jackson's popular administration 30 years after John Adams 
named Marshall to the Supreme Court 30 years later. Roger Tawney's pro-Southern court made the decision in the dreadful, fateful Dred Scott decision, ruled that members of the African race were not and could never become citizens of the United States. And almost, almost all scholars believe that that decision helped bring on the Civil War. And, and this point is hard, hard, think, hard to think about, but the Dred Scott decision was handed down 20 years after Andrew Jackson appointed Taney to be Chief Justice, 20 years later. And probably the most notable example was in the 1930s when the Four Horsemen, as they were called in the Old Deal, brought the court as an institution to one of its lowest stabs in greatest crisis when it flouted the nation's voters by vetoing much of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And in each of these instances, as so often in our history, a majority of the justices were behind the political times. <coughs> in a sense, it's inevitable that the court should be a break on the rest of the machinery of government. By its very nature, the way it works, the court, for all of its power, its members hold it is only a negative, never an affirmative, never an affirmative force. It cannot create, it cannot initiate, it cannot put into action any government policy of any kind. All the justices can do is to approve or disapprove. After they're asked to do so, either by a law passed by a legislature, an order given by the executive, a rule made by a commission, an effort made by a law enforcement officer to find somebody and put someone in jail. And those are decisions we've read about in just the last few years. Until Lamp gave me this assignment, I had not understood an answer that I gave while I was a state senator to a question that came up from an audience. I was in a town in which every road in and out of that town had a billboard with a great big photograph that said, impeach Oral Warren. I thought that my political career was over when I said I did not support that goal because, and this was the answer I gave as a kid, I said the Supreme Court is always going to be 20 years ahead or 20 years behind the times. Until September of 2016, I did not know that that answer grew from a seed planted by Charles Allen Wright and Fred Rodell in 1959. And here is how Nine Men ends its, that book written in the late 50s. O'Shaughnessy, the Irish poet, once sang, for each age is a dream that is dying and one that is coming to birth. Over what was then 165 years, through age after a different age, the justice of the Supreme Court have attended the birth and the death of different dreams. And on an affirmation of faith, he ended by saying the bravest dream of all, the American dream of freedom. Two experiences late in 2016 shaped my political observation for these last few moments. Nell Delaney, who was the wife of Pete Laney, the longtime Democratic Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, was buried at the state cemetery. The first speaker at the graveside ceremony was Laura Bush, wife of George W. Bush, former governor and president of the United States. Laura started her remarks this way. When George became governor, the Laneys and the Bushes became close friends. We were Republicans and the Laneys were Democrats, but more importantly, we were Texans. During George W's time as governor, the Laneys and the Bushes worked together for good public policy that was nonpartisan, but was good for Texas. The second recent example 
is a talk by an old friend, Sandy Levinson, who is a unique and a genuine constitutional scholar who teaches at the University of Texas School of Law. Sandy said that the Supreme Court was not the most important issue in the presidential election of that year. It was the election of people who had the power without court approval to make changes that would make our democracy work better. His two issues were to eliminate the filibuster in the U.S. Senate and reform the way we draw political districts. Let me briefly discuss each one as I do, and I'd like to remind you because both political parties need to be reminded of Disraeli's warning that power corrupts in all and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Both political parties are guilty of not making changes when they had the power to do so. They don't want they do not want to relinquish the power they have. And it will be a bucket uphill battle to make the changes that are, Sandy talked about. <coughs> On filibuster and closure. My initial reaction was to agree with that suggestion, but on reflection, I would call myself an agnostic about filibuster. <coughs> it is the time when an effort is made to hold the Senate floor in order to prevent a vote on the bill or confirmation. In 1917, the United States Senate adopted a rule at the urging of President Woodrow Wilson that allowed the Senate to end debate with a two-thirds majority vote. In 1975, the Senate reduced that number to two-thirds to two, three-fifths, or 60 as we currently have. And this is the impasse that was so much in the news in regard to President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland because they did not have 60 votes to have closure. My first inclination was to say eliminating the filibuster is a good thing until I recall my Texas Senate colleague, an ultra-liberal and the only Jew in the Senate in my time, who reminded the Texas Senate why it was an important tool. This was Babe Schwartz out of Galveston. Babe was talking to the another ultra-liberal Senator Oscar Mosey from Dallas, who was head of the administration committee proposing that the filibusters be listed, list, li, li, limited to 24 hours. In Babe's speech of opposition, he said, I rarely disagree with the distinguished senator from Dallas, but on this issue, he is just plain wrong. He does not know what it is to be a minority. He is a wasu, a white, Anglo-Saxon Unitarian. <laughs> One other personal experience that gives me pause on this issue is what used to be the rule of 11 in the Texas Senate. Out of 31 state senators to bring a bill up, it used to require a two-thirds vote. It was often a roadblock, but on most of the important big issues that affect Texans, it was something that could be resolved. And it, many issues that were blocked returned two years later and were very much improved. What I call the art of governing, which is compromise, was reached. Two or three, two or three opposing sides got some of what they wanted, but not all of what they wanted. In a diverse society, the system works. When all of the parties are willing to give a little and lose a little to bring others along. I had to recall Jimmy Stewart in his role as Senator Jefferson Smith and Frank Capras. Mr. Smith goes to Washington and even J. Throng Sturman, who filibustered for 24 hours and 18 minutes against the Civil Rights Act, 1957. What if I were in the minority? I don't know. So I just raise the issue because Sandy Levinson points out that a change does not require a Supreme Court decision. Only a majority of 100 senators. <coughs> I must just spend one comment 
a decision that I, this is putting my own thought in. One of the worst decisions I think of the court is Citizens United, a ruling that was passed down in January of 2010. It essentially tossed out the long-standing ban on corporations and labor unions making independent expenditures and financing electioneering communications. It gave corporations and unions the green light to spend unlimited sums on ads and other political tools calling for the election or the defeat of individual candidates. In a nutshell, the High Court's five to four decision said that it's okay for corporations and labor unions to spend as much as they want to convince people to vote for or against a candidate. <coughs> that decision in a later court ruling based on Citizens United led to the creation of super political action committees which are now acting as shadow political parties for both Democrats and Republicans. And that one decision was a driving force behind the unexpected support when I wrote the remarks first time of Cindy, Senator Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primary, mainly because it is such a huge issue among millenniums. I don't think we have too many here today. <laughs> in my personal opinion, neither a corporation, a labor union, or a super PAC is a citizen and should not be allowed to be one for campaign contributions. Just a couple of comments on voting rights, but because that's where Sandy Levinson says the real power is. It took five amendments in 100 years to end voter discrimination. Women and African Americans were not allowed to step into a voting booth for almost 80 years. It wasn't until 1869 and the 15th Amendment was ratified that males of all ages got to vote. And I emphasize it was males and not females. Only males were allowed to vote. It took another <laughs> 50 years, another 50 years for women to finally get suffrage when the 19th Amendment was passed in 1919. And then another key one was the 24th Amendment to the Constitution. January of 1964, which banned poll taxes, the tax that was imposed for the right to vote. In some states, including Texas, used the poll tax to chase ethnic and poor people away from the ballot box. I have it in here, not in my notes, but a note that I made in thinking about the remarks. When I was in the Senate in 1972, Texas Senate voted for the Equal Rights Amendment to the United States Constitution, 28, 38, 48, 50 years ago. That amendment has still not passed. And it was almost a unanimous vote in the Texas Senate at that time for it to be ratified. So it takes a long time to make some of these changes. And one other one that was finally made, during the bitter years of the Vietnam War, Americans realized that if young people were going to be ordered to fight and die, they deserve the right to, to choose their leaders. So the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. President Nixon signed it after Congress and the states passed it, ratified it in 1971. The most egregious vehicle to discourage voters, in which in my judgment is the bedrock for much of the discontent among millenniums and other citizens who feel that they are not being heard by their elected officials is the way that districts are drawn for those officials who are closest to the people, members of Congress, state senators and representatives, and even city councils. And if I know, and I want to give credit to my son, Lynn, who's with me, if we know how to do this, I'm going to push this button. There you are. I got to go back. <laughs> there. More. More. Oh. Yep. Because here is how gerrymandering in its most basic form. I'm not sure whether you see the same as I do. You do. But 60% of the population are blue, 40% are red in this example. The one in the middle, 
the one in the middle would show the districts that are compact but are not fair. The one next to it would show compact but unfair and the next to it would show neither compact or fair because the one would have all blues winning and none of the reds would be represented. The other would have a disc, change it completely around if you want to draw it the way it is on my right. Contrary to one popular misconception about the practice, the point of gerrymandering is not to draw yourself a collection of overwhelmingly safe seats, rather it is to give your opponent a small number of safe seats while drawing yourself a larger number of seats that are not quite as safe, but that have that you can expect to win comfortably. Here are five examples that both political parties are guilty of. And they're all on one shot there. So I think the first one is Maryland, which was drawn by Democrats, and it's to keep John Sarbanes a Democrat in office. And I'll have to kind of move through them on you. And then I think the next one is Lloyd Dockett's district here in Texas. And it runs from Austin down to San Antonio. And then there will be a shot later showing it runs right down I-35. And then you have Republicans do one up in Dallas, the Mark Vesey, and it is the big square running over. And it runs from Dallas through Grand Prairie, Arlington to Fort Worth. 